I do want to introduce our next panelist, um, who is Dr. James Barnard, um, Global Practice and Technologies Leader for Advanced Biological Treatment uh, with Black & Veatch Corporation. Dr. Bernard received the Clark Prize in, excuse me, in 2007. Congratulations. It's, we're honored to have a Clark Prize recipient come back and address us today. Uh, Dr. Bernard has traveled the world researching and implementing better ways to conserve water resources and improve wastewater treatment for over 40 years. He created the Biological Nutrient Removal, BNR process, which is the application of bacteria to remove both nitrogen and phosphorus from water. Actively designs and supervises the construction and startup of BNR systems all around the world, adapting the technology to varying climates, infrastructure, and environmental pressures, and has served on the nitrogen toxic excuse me, nitrogen technical advisory panel for New York City Department of Environmental Protection for ten years, where help where he helped guide a fifty million BNR research and development program for the Upper East River and Jamaica Bay areas. And with that, uh, welcome Dr. James Bernard. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, my talk about the recovery of nutrients, I, uh, I would like to go in, what's the driver? Why, why are we talking about this? And uh, the um, looming food crisis, which is caused, of course, by our, this population explosion. And it, I'm reminded that when I started working in this research, there was only three and a half billion people in the world. There's now seven billion. So you can see what has been pushing this whole concept of, well, eutrophication, uh, removing of nutrients, and of course then now the recovery of nutrients. But on top of that, we also see this population uh, distribution, which is rather scary, because you see the distribution in the more developed regions, and in the less developed regions, you have a huge um, bottom part there, which is still aspiring to a better life, uh, using more resources, and uh, you can see that is going to be a big push on our resources. Then on top of that, we've got the urbanization, uh, and uh, it's estimated that by 2035, <coughs> I'll be exactly 100 years old then, 60% uh, <laughs> of the global population will live in cities, which means trans uh, transporting more food away from where it's pr uh, produced and uh, putting a bigger strain on the uh, resources. Now, I um, brought this in, uh, I saw this in foreign policy, and it, that was last year, and it says as the new year begins, the price of wheat is setting an all-time record in the UK. Russia is importing grain to sustain its fat cattle herds. India is less wrestling with an 80% food inflation. Uh, and China looking abroad for large quantities of wheat and corn. Uh, so one can see, uh, sorry, I uh, got the wrong way, the pressure on food. But the, one of the other uh, interesting uh, uh, points from this article is that every night, when every morning we wake up, there's 220,000 new mouths to feed. Um, U.S. and Canada is producing about two-thirds of all the surplus food in the world. In other words, uh, most, many countries, or most countries, um, they're not self-sufficient in food and that extra is coming from here. But now the U.S. uses about 40% of the grains for biofuel, and what they state is that the world's safety net has disappeared. And uh, on top of that, uh, food production in many countries are relying on water bubbles. I didn't know, for instance, that Saudi Arabia is self-sufficient in wheat, but their, uh, their source of water is running out, and it's not replenished. Uh, we also have some bubbles here in the U.S., and all of these, when these water bubbles run out, all of these would become food, in source, uh, uh, food importers. Then there's the increased affluent, affluence required, um, more water and nutrients, like in China and uh, some of the uh, Oriental countries, and then also uh, they mentioned the increased cost of fertilizer, and that's what I would like to concentrate on. So if we use looking at uh, wastewater as a resource, and uh, 
In uh, Singapore, I noticed they use the word used water, which I think is probably a much better word to use as wastewater because we don't want to have the connotation that this water is wasted. And um, if we start looking at all the opportunities, uh, starting from home, uh, urine separation is uh, a, a very important one. And uh, I will talk about that later. But coming down here, we see protein recovery, for instance. And uh, a lot of industries, uh, we can recover the protein before we send it to the treatment plant, where we spend energy to break it down and then try to recover it again. Why not recover it up front? Uh, Dr. Pretorius uh, uh, from South Africa showed in a study that um, that could actually be profitable in many situations. And even when you have a waste like a Birberry waste and you, you can grow the organisms in there and capture that, that could become uh, animal food. Now, if we go through the, the water treatment plant, we have got many uses of the water. Or one would be post potable reuse. Irrigation in... Um, Florida, for instance, many of the cities there are now <coughs> recycling about 100% of their water for irrigation, relieving the pressure on water for the uh, domestic supplies. And then uh, another one that is, especially in the colder climates, is getting heat from water from the effluent. And the potential there is about four times the amount of energy that's used in here can be recovered as heat uh, in, in from the effluent. And I know downtown Stockholm is heated by uh, the heat from the effluent from the plant. If we go to a BNR plant, we concentrate the phosphorus here in the sludge, and um, we can recover that phosphorus as a nutrient, or we can uh, do some land application, but uh, unless, of course, that is done efficiently, it's, it can also be a waste. Um, when we look at the, the chemicals of the earth, of course, nitrogen, uh, one of the nutrients where we can recover, there's a lot of us, I mean, the old atmosphere is 80% nitrogen. But when you look down here at phosphorus, it, we're down here at a very, very small percentage. Uh, the phosphorus is scarce, and it's too precious to squander. But let's just look at the nitrogen, for instance, nitrogen recycle, um, around about century and a half ago, maybe a little more, uh, everything was uh, fairly well in balance. And, the, 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 uh, and, and this applies to nitrogen and phosphorus. And the crops that were used, everything got plowed back into the soil again because the food production was near where the food was consumed. But as the, uh, with the industrial development, the industrial revolution, people moved away, which means that uh, the crops moved away and you have to uh, um, resupply the nutrients because you're taking the nutrients with the crops. And that has led to uh, almost to uh, a, a starvation situation already more than a century and a half ago. And uh, guano was used, that ran out. But fortunately, the Harbor Bosch process was developed, and not to save the world, but to make munitions. Uh, but fortunately, it did save the world, and it's using a lot of energy, but that's our main supply of nutrients now. In the 1970s, uh, there was an attempt to uh, recover uh, uh, nitrogen directly from the used water. And here you see the uh, upper aquaquin plant, which is, uh, we had to get the nitrogen down to a level of one milligram per liter. Uh, for discharge into the Occoquan Lake, which is a water supply for Fairfax County, Virginia. And uh, this uh, ion exchange uh, unit was built there and worked very successfully, but unfortunately broke down after, I think, about three or four months of operation. And the only thing they could do at that time was to um, nitrify within the plant because th that was ammonia ion exchange, and they had to operate the plant to produce ammonia, but when they apply, then they uh, uh, operated the plant to remove uh, to produce nitrates, and when they put the nitrates in the lake, they found that the lake actually improved because it was phosphorus limiting, and by putting nitrates in, they grew better algae, and from from the phosphorus that's there that you cannot uh, um, take out anyway, the few sources, uh, and uh, at the same time it prevented. Uh, phosphorus from leaching back from the soil. So right now, 
plants about four times the size, but they specifically operate that plant not to denitrify. They want the nitrates in the lake to improve the quality of the lake. So that's put a bit of a damper on recycling. So what was left over is to recycle from the return streams where we have very high concentrations of uh, nitrogen, of ammonia. And here you see the top part of a plant that was built in Oslo and the um, ammonia is stripped and then captured and um, a nitric acid is used to capture it. And here you see the bottom part. Final product is 54% ammonium nitrate, a very good fertilizer, and about 90% nitrogen removal. But at the same time, we have seen the development now of the Animox process, which is a process that actually short circuits the normal nitrification and denitrification process. And instead of having to go all the way with all the nitrate, all the ammonia to nitrite and then nitrate and all that energy, and then use carbon for denitrification, these Animox bacteria, you need only to go halfway with, uh, uh, with the nitrite portion of it, and then they can reduce the nitrogen to nitrogen gas. And that's put a big damper on any reclamation because now it's just a lot cheaper and cause, uh, takes a lot less energy to um, remove that nitrogen in the return streams. So nitrogen recovery is only going to be viable if less energy is used uh, in the process than fixing the nitrogen from the atmosphere. So the competition here is with the Harbor Bosch process that uses about 12 kilowatt hours per kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer. And nitrogen, phosphorus is a different situation. Uh, again, we have the phosphorus cycle. There's only a limited amount of phosphorus in the world. There are some every, little everywhere but if you grow the crops and remove the crops out of the system, you remove the phosphorus. And there's some leaching and some runoff. And the only way you can make up for that is by mineral fertilizer. So what has happened over the centuries, uh, around about 1850s, they started running out of organic uh, phosphorus supplies and started mining phosphorus. And here you see what happened, especially taking off here in the 1940s. And this is now the, the uh, mining uh, of phosphorus rock that we see. And that is a limited resource. And this is a scenario by Cordell. And what he showed here is that if we do nothing, well, somewhere in the future, we're going to run out of these phosphate resources. There's only a limited amount in the world. And when we see the need, if we go on as now, it's going to be up there. So we will have to change many things. We have to change our diets and not eat so much high quality food. Um, we have to look at the food chain efficiency because right now I think only about 10% or whatever of the phosphorus actually reaches the final food product. We look at agriculture efficiency, because right now farmers are still just adding phosphorus because they don't want to take the chance. But studies have shown that there's so much phosphorus already there that many times they can uh, stop adding for three or four years and it will not affect the, uh, the crop. And then when you look at all of that, we are talking about uh, the, um, the recovering phosphorus from the used water or wastewater. Uh, the other picture that is important is where is the phosphorus? The U.S. was one of the biggest producers, but also one of the biggest users. And it's, uh, our supplies are now down. Resources are now down. So we are left with basically China and uh, Morocco. And uh, I hear the argument that, yes, as the price goes up, more phosphorus uh, um, ore will be discovered, and, and a lot of more has been discovered, low-grade phosphorus in Morocco. And that's where the picture is now, where you see Morocco and China. China already sees it as a, as a, uh, a strategic mineral, which means the rest of the world will rely on one country for the supply of phosphorus. I want to uh, just bring up this picture again of Asimov, who said, we may be able to stop, substitute nuclear power for coal power and uh, plastics for wood and yeast for meat and friendliness for isolation. But for phosphorus, there's neither substitute nor replacement. 
when we started mining uh, phosphorus, uh, there was one billion people in the world, and uh, one, it, it's scary to think what would happen when we run out of resources. So the concept of recovery of phosphorus then, and uh, Europe, for instance, uh, in Sweden already there's a goal set that of getting 70% of that phosphorus recycled. So if we look at the wastewater, we go down, 100% of that phosphorus is in there. If we remove the phosphorus from the effluent and say 1% of it's going in the effluent, which means 99% goes into the biosolids because uh, as somebody um, put it, the only volatile phosphorus that you get is the flies that fly out. <laughs> and it's got to go in the solids. So if it's in the biosolids, and we have a biological removal process, then about up to a maximum of 50% can be recovered uh, readily and, and quite cheaply with, for instance, the Ostara process. If we, uh, our alternatives then is land application, but of course if land application is not applied in accordance to the need for phosphorus, it's also a waste. And uh, if it's incinerated, then it's gone, it's, it's lost. But the Germans have designed the MEFRIC uh, process in which they combine energy consumption or energy uh, development with phosphorus recovery. It's a very interesting process uh, in which they, they, they um, uh, pelletize the sludge and then put carbon uh, and, and some lime in it and take the temperature up to 1,400 degrees. And then when they quench that, they find that they can produce um, a, a pellets that contain phosphorus that is actually recyclable. And they feel that's the only way, if you have to re recover to that high level, that you can uh, actually make a profit out of it. The alternative, and in Europe this is, uh, my, uh, mono, mono incineration is already a, a, um, uh, done in very many places. And here again, if you do biological waste treatment, then about 50% of that um, solids uh, is available, uh, of the phosphorus in the solids is available um, to uh, plant growth. But then there is, it could be the raw material for phosphorus, the ash, or there are a, a number of processes that have been developed to chemically take it out, and especially if you have a chemical removal process to chemically take it out uh, and recover it. But the other option that is there is just put it in a mono landfill so that it is not wasted. And uh, we see here the uh, process of incineration and all the, all the phosphorus is in the ash. So we can get that phosphorus and put it in a dedicated site. Then 100 years from now, uh, our descendants will have that phosphorus would not be wasted. The uh, development of struvite uh, as a means of recovering phosphorus has been actually going on for some time already. Japan has been at it for uh, quite a number of years. And, uh, and the development of the Ostara process that the previous speaker mentioned, a uh, very interesting development. Uh, struvite is magnesium ammonium phosphate. And if we reduce, if we remove phosphorus, we also remove magnesium. We concentrate both the, the phosphorus in the influent and the magnesium. We go to, to digestion, we have a lot of ammonia, we have some magnesium and the phosphate. If we just add some more magnesium and raise the pH, we precipitate struvite. It's been a nuisance, but they have turned this into a, um, uh, an acid and producing these pearls which are pure struvite, there's no organic uh, matter in it at all. And uh, in the process, you also recover 20% of the nitrogen. They have uh, put some plants. It's making rapid progress. Um, a number of municipalities are already doing this. Uh, this was Rock Creek of the uh, Clean Water Services. And uh, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. Uh, opened the, uh, the facility. And I got introduced to him. And he said, uh, they said, he's the guy that started it all. And so, uh, you know, once you get to that point, what do you say next? So I said to him, well, when I started this work and I told the people what we are doing, I was called a snake oil salesman. 
And he said, OK, I want my picture taken with the snake oil sales. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, it is interesting looking at opportunities. And here, for instance, is a treatment of a potato waste in, uh, in Holland. And uh, where they go through, with the potato waste, it's very strong, and uh, uh, COD, very strong. So they go through a UASB, but it's also got a lot of sulfur in it. So they take the gas and capture the, the hydrogen sulfide and turn it into sulfur. So they produce sulfur. Uh, then they go through the struvite removing process, removing process by adding um, uh, magnesium chloride and then aerating it. And then with a, with a um, cyclone, they get the struvite out of the process. And then in the final process, they go through the Animox process using very little energy, and since you've removed the carbon up here, the struvite, I mean, the Animox process doesn't need carbon for nitrogen removal. Um, and uh, we are just looking right now also at the possibility of applying this somewhere in the Midwest to potato waste. Uh, I want to say that after all of this, we're talking about using corn for biofuel production, and 40% of the grain crop going to biofuels um, there's no gain in energy, and it's done at enormous uh, subsidies. But while we're trying to look at, uh, you know, saving the phosphorus supplies in the world, that uses an estimated 1.7 million tons of phosphorus, and uh, it is it is there are alternatives, and uh, I, I personally think it's a bit of a disgrace. Uh, urine recovery. Um, that is something that looks far-fetched, but urine contains um, 60, 70 to 80 percent of all the nitrogen and phosphorus in the domestic wastewater. And when the urine is separated and stored, um, the ammonia is hydrolyzed, the pH goes up, and in a short while it is totally sterile. And when it's diluted, the odor is not there because that's just the ammonia that does that. And also, of course, a struvite can be recovered very easily from that. In Sweden, they've already developed this uh, dual flush toilet in which the urine will go on one side and the rest will go the other side. And there they have the collection system and the farmers can come and pick it up there. But where I see this is not something that's going to happen overnight, but there are so many um, countries in the world, the developing countries, where Food is getting very expensive. Fertilizer is unaffordable. And um, institutes in Sweden and in Switzerland is now having training courses in developing countries to teach people how to use the fertilizer, how to use urine as a fertilizer. And it's estimated that in Kampala, about half the food consumed in the city is uh, produced in backyard gardens like these. And I think that is where we, we we must start, but we'll also have to start thinking um, with so many people moving into the cities, huge big city blocks, um, can we not apply the same uh, there and uh, regain some of that material? And the motto of today then is, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> Thank you very much.